What's going on, man? Hey, Chief. How are you? Man, I I really truly don't think I've seen you since Combat Skills. <laughs> what do you mean, like in person? In person, because I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, we were always hanging. We always hung out at Combat Skills. We were always, you know, that was a good time. Um, but then I was like, okay, so when did I see him after that? And I was like rolling through my head. I'm like, it's been like 10 years. That's right. Yeah, we never, somehow, we never ran into each other. No. Like in the in the legal world, in the, in the paralegal world, we just never did. In, in a training, in a TDY, which is, which is odd. Right, because I know, because you went over, you did the... Um, um, you're in PME, if I remember right, weren't you? Right, yeah, I did that for about three and a half years. Right, and then you're also overseas as well. Right, the whole time. So I was at Kadena for seven and a half years. Man, you're, you're like living the dream that everybody wants to do. Go overseas, stay overseas. That's right. Well, I mean, there's some people that, you know, that spend a lot more time over there than what I did, but... Uh, it was a good time. It was a good run. I wanted to <laughs> extend it, <laughs> but I wasn't allowed to do that. Oh, you're going to try to go, you know, I'm going to stay at Kadena, but then I'm going to get a hardship and have to go over to Ramstein for a few years. And then maybe I'll have to come back to Yakota. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, I wasn't trying to be that greedy, right? I was trying to go to Korea. <laughs> Well, that's true. Everybody kind of has to put in their time in uh, some of the hard places in order to get the really bright spots. You know, my I did my 365 in Afghanistan and I went from there, spent four months in Texas and three years in Hawaii. That's right. Yeah, that's not too bad. But sometimes, yeah, that's right. That's what we got to do in order to, you know, to get to those spots where we want to go to. So I would have done the Korea thing for sure. Like I was really targeting that but it didn't materialize one of the uh one of the final inspections i was able to do um i was able to go over and we did uh actually i don't even think it was one of the final inspections it was just one that really stuck out to me we did uh two full weeks in korea and so uh me and my boss at that point we actually flew in early because he wanted to shop Mm -hmm. um so we spent the first, you know, half of the, you know, half a week on leave there, just running around uh, Osan and going to Seoul, and it was so much fun. And I did um, Korea as a weapons guy back in uh, 99, 2000, and I just sat around feeling sorry for myself. I never got out to see how awesome that place was. Mm-hmm. And so when I went back, I'm like, dang, I wasted that entire time here because I just wanted to drink and feel sorry for myself. Right. Yeah. yeah, and that's the crazy thing, right? Sometimes, a lot of times, if we don't have any experience with the area, mm-hmm. uh, we kind of like, oh, no, I don't want to go to Korea or whatever. But I had an opportunity to go, again, as an ALS instructor, I went to the Y to teach a class at Kunsan because they didn't have like a standing mm-hmm. like, staff or ALS instructors. So I went to teach one class to Kunsan. It wasn't even, you know, Osan, which is where, you know, where the, where the spotlight is. Right. And I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun in Kunsan. It's a very tight knit community mm-hmm. in Kunsan. Like everyone knows each other. Everyone, you know, knows everyone. Um, it was really nice. So I was really aiming for Kunsan out of uh, right. <laughs> out of Kadena because it's nice. I- ironically enough, uh, I attended ALS at Osan Air Base where they brought in the uh, the ALS staff um, from all over PACAF to be able to do it. I think. I want to say the the superintendent was from Kadena. I think my instructor was from Guam. Another one was from Hickam. And I got to go TDY because I was down at Kunsan. I got to go TDY from Kunsan up to Osan, which was awesome because, you know, you know, you call that going down to Kunsan, you call that the Osan appreciation tour. Um, you think it's bad there, go down to Kunsan, but you're absolutely right though. It's like that tight knit group. Um, which is so awesome. Right. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. I met some paralegals over there. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, one of the ones that I met over there is going to be doing a podcast here soon as well. So he's deployed right now. Uh-huh. Who is uh, that? Uh, Olaya Gonzalez. Don't think I've ever met him. No. Yeah, so he's in a deployment in Honduras, which, you know, when we talk about deployments, that wasn't even one that 
I knew was out there. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 When I went to ACC, we were finding all sorts of crazy ones that were kind of specifically out of uh, the 12th air force going down to uh, the, the Southcom AOR, Honduras, uh, Panama places down there. Our folks were going down there all the time. And it was one of those, I wish I would have paid more attention in uh, Spanish class so I could speak a little bit of the language so I could even have an opportunity to go down there. Right. And of course I couldn't pull the, you know, well, I need to go down there and see what they're doing. I couldn't justify that. <laughs> would have been awesome though. That's right. Yeah. So um, I know we have some hidden deployments and that may be into the conversation. Okay. Um, the, de the deployment conversation as well, because I know you did a couple, more than a couple. Um, I, I, I did the 365. I also deployed as a bomb loader. Um, in fact, it was a little bit uh, surreal, probably about two weeks ago. Um, Colonel Ecton and I, as things were kind of ramping, um, ramping up over in the Middle East a year ago, he and I were over and we did a tour of Jordan, Kuwait, and... Um, Oh, Al UD, so Qatar and uh, UAE. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just a year ago, and it seemed like seems like forever ago now. So I, I've seen a few things. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. All right. So how's life? I know that uh, you retired here recently. When did you officially retire? So my official retirement date was uh, 1 August. Um, I, I got here in Norman, Oklahoma, uh, probably the middle of May to go and get the family settled, the house settled. Um, certainly been a long summer here with uh, everything going on uh, COVID wise. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's been different. It's been interesting for me because I kept on waiting for, you know, a phone call. I kept on waiting for an email. I kept on waiting for the stuff that I was used to. And it was just almost seemed too quiet for a while. But uh, when I got to 1 August, it was definitely very surreal of, you know, wow, it, it, it's really that this that part of my life is really over and it's time to go and move on to the next step. Right. Yeah, that is definitely interesting just to think because we all dream of that moment, right? Like <laughs> we all think about that moment. Um, I'm not sure how you know, some people more often than others. Um, right. And, and a lot of sometimes, you know, there's some people who go and think about, you know, the retirement ceremony and having to stand up in front of folks and what are they going to say? Are they going to be able to keep it together? Um, you know, I, I was never much of uh, wanting even a retirement ceremony. I just I, I don't like things being about me. I don't know if I would have been able to handle it standing up in front of everybody. Um, so COVID took care of that but towards the end it was one of those things where you know there is a little bit of me that wish I could have had a little bit more of an opportunity to say goodbye you know not not just to say you know thank you to my wife and my kids and my family for everything they've gone through but to uh, say goodbye goodbye to the amazing folks around me that have been there my whole career right yeah no absolutely where, where were you um, when you retired? What base were you at? Where were you? So I was at Langley. Um, I was the ACC command paralegal manager there. Oh, okay. And uh, I was one of, there was four of us who uh, were all retiring all around the same time. And so it turned into a Zoom retirement that we had for each of us. Oh, wow. So that's how it happened then through Zoom. And you had people like from, from the command or people from the office? Yeah. Like how many people were... So at, at that point in time, it was a maximum of 10 people were allowed in one room. And I think I, we had exactly 10 people and uh, Colonel Lecton, who uh, he's now since retired, the, uh, the, the SJA for ACC in his office. Mm -hmm. And it was very much a social distance, you know, kind of here, here's your stuff. Here's your stuff. Do you have anything to say? And um, we set up Zoom and um, I, I was very humbled with the amount of people who showed up for the Zoom, um, but I took the opportunity at the end to be able to kind of sit down and kind of go through every, every single person so I could say something because it meant a lot that uh, they took the time to do that. But uh, it was definitely very odd and weird, but it's, you know, it's what we had to do during these times. Right. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been eye-opening and we've all had to to flex and to adjust like we just had i think last week here on base we had the air force ball which was a drive-in air force ball right like wow 
that's what they decided to do. And I don't think they had it available for anyone to see like on zoom or anything like mm -hmm. that, but people could bring their families. You could be in uniform, but you had to stay in the car so you couldn't get out of the car. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some events and stuff like that, but you know, that's to the extent that, that, that we've had to go and people thinking about these different things. It's right. Interesting. So, something amazing though, is, um, all these things that started, you know, particularly, you know, seeing it on the uh, the paralegal side, um, right before um, everything really, really shut down, there was the uh, the Facebook page that stood up, which uh, I, I was very uh, humbled to be able to get an opportunity to go and sit and talk with them. I was the first uh, chief chat that they got to do, right. which hopefully I didn't uh, spout off too much when I was doing that. But uh, the, the, the technology that we're utilizing, you know, yourself with this uh, paralegal podcast, um, to be able to communicate with everybody virtually in some way, shape or form, it's, it's something that I think that's definitely been missing with us for a long time. We, you know, you always tend to remember that, you know, you used to go to the old uh, Keystones, um, now the Horizon, and it would be like a family reunion because you'd see all these people from, you know, a long time ago. And that's where you're supposed to start sharing the ideas of, you know, what's going right and what's going wrong um, in your offices versus now where, you know, JAI, we try the best we can to go and push information, but people were only willing to take as much information as they wanted to actively get, no matter how much we pushed out. Now it seems like with this involvement in the technology, there's all these amazing ideas that are going around to where, from my opinion, five years, 10 years from now, I can't wait to see where things go. Right. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That Facebook page, um, I think that that was the, you know, like the seed that needed to be planted um, in order for all these ideas, because now a lot of different things are emerging just from that one step. And, you know, Master Sergeant Puma and Senior Master Sergeant Crow, they've done an amazing job with that, with getting dif different people involved with just getting the message out there with dif different chiefs from different career fields. Um, mm -hmm. And now we're just, yeah, I feel like the paralegal career field is perhaps more connected than it's ever been. Um, Cause you know, we, I don't know, me, a new paralegal sitting at Lackland or even a paralegal being at Kadena air base. I didn't even mm -hmm. know what was going on within the NAF. Like I didn't know what was happening and Misawa or in Yokota, like, even though they were like our most, you know, like neighboring legal offices, mm -hmm. I had no idea what they were doing, how, what their, their struggles were with courts or anything like that. But it seems like now, um, yeah, now we are definitely talking to one another. We know what's happening at different bases and we're more willing and able to, to share uh, mm -hmm. what we're all going through. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, believe it or not, I'm, I'm still a Facebook stalker out there. So I'm still a part of like the Facebook group. So I see some of the stuff, I see some of the conversations and it, it's great that people are more open to go and ask anything that's going on and ask all the questions. Um, um, sorry, I refer to him as Joey, but I've, I've known Joey for a very, very long time. And um, he, he recently did something where he posted a very, very raw and real post that I, I think was very important to go and put out the fact of, you know, the vulnerability that he showed. Um, and, and I think as a leader, that's something that uh, has to be shown sometimes, you know, we're not immune. We're, we're not almighty and all powerful. You have to show that there's some vulnerability and sometimes that you do need to disconnect and sometimes you need to ask for help. Um, the, the folks, all of you, yourself included, who are doing all these things, um, are, it's absolutely incredible. So please, 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 please keep doing it. No, absolutely. Yeah, this is, the message is definitely getting out there and the right message is getting out there as well. So yeah, no, I was extremely proud of um, Sergeant Kroll doing what, you know, what he did on that. Cause it takes, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And then, you know, the hope is that other people can also, you know, right. you see a leader and you see someone, you know, of, at that level who is sharing those experiences and those struggles. And, and it opens the door to be able to talk about it because it's very, very hard to, to talk about um, when people are in that situation, because, you know, let's face it. Um, we being a paralegal, being a Jag, being in this career field, it can be really hard. Sometimes we have moments of greatness where we get to go and 
help people out. We get to solve their problems, which are awesome. But we also have some pretty big lows as well, where, you know, we're some of the cases that we have to deal with, some of the things we have to see. Um, you know, I, I still very vividly remember having to go and watch somebody get escorted out of the courtroom where you had uh, his, this guy's uh, two little daughters crying in their mom's arm, asking where's daddy's going. Um, you have to be absolutely heartless if that doesn't get to you in one some way, shape or form. And that's the kind of thing that our folks are dealing with all the time, every day. And if you, at some point in time, you have to ask for help and be vulnerable and accept that help. And we have to be able to take care of each other. Right. Absolutely. I'm one, sorry. I get, I get a little bit uh, emotional on that one too. I saw it too many times at JAI when I was out and I saw people who were hurting and they just wanted help. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and one thing that I can say about it, the Jack Corps though, is that I think we, I'm extremely proud of what the Jack Corps is doing in regards to that subject. Because I've, I've now been to paid and I've been to LOMSI and in, in, no, in both those courses, they've introduced the vicarious trauma training right. that they have. And, it, and it's important to explain how normal it is to, because to, maybe sometimes we, we can't really cope with it, well, what, it, what it is that we're feeling mm -hmm. um, because it's not really happening to, happening to us directly, but we are, you know, like essentially living it through them because we're seeing it with, we're experiencing it. We're seeing it in the courtroom or within the reports or the evidence that we're getting. Um, and even in the defense paralegals and, and, and um, SVPs as well, um, they are definitely hearing it uh, mm -hmm. from these individuals and living it. Um, so it's important for us to, to be conscious and, and, and to know that it's normal uh, to, for those things to really get to us and that we, we can have an avenue to talk about that with other people and that we're not alone. Absolutely agree. One hundred percent. So. All right. So just kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, Don't worry. And we, you know, we, we've already had a really nice conversation. Where we haven't done the <laughs> formal introduction. So we are here with <laughs> Chief Master Sergeant Retire uh, Thomas Hamilton. And, uh, you know, we met. Wow. Yeah. So you, you mentioned it that we met what, about 10, I think 11 years ago now. Because uh, it was 2009, a uh, cast training, uh, 2009. Yeah, I think it was October, October, September, October, 2009. Um, my, outside of being able to hang out with everybody, my main memory was our very last thing we had to do for that entire class, not the JA side, which I thought that training was phenomenal, right. but it was the actual cast side, and it was a nor'easter. And it was like the first nor'easter of the year. And we we're doing this final field exercise training. And it was like 40. Do you remember this? It was 42 degrees. It was raining like crazy. I remember I threw away my boots. I threw away my uniform. I threw away everything after that day. That was so miserable. It was. But it really got me ready for Afghanistan. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it got me ready for Iraq as well. But it was, yeah, it was terrible. I did the same. So I was glad. <laughs> Cause I was wearing my BDUs and, and that was the last time I wore them. Cause I had ADUs that were issued to me for that deployment. So that was it. That's the last time I ever saw BDUs mm -hmm. and they were going away. Right. Cause I, I remember I brought specifically, it was my original black boots from basic military training. And I was warned that I was going to go and just bring anything that I could destroy. And I remember I destroyed them so bad that when we got back to that dorm, I just, Chuck. Right. Right. So it was the perfect, it was the perfect situation for us to not even have any sort of like, uh, you know, like a, you know, like a tear up moment. Nope. Here it goes. It's done. <laughs> yeah. Are we done? Are we done? Can we go to the airport yet? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, but that was, you know, I had a lot of fun at mm -hmm. both really, um, mainly the, the cast JA uh, was really good. And then the normal, the, the, you know, the, the, the right. one for everyone else was pretty good too. Yeah. The, uh, I thought the cast JA, um, to this day, I still sometimes go back to that because, uh, especially, um, in the Afghanistan world when I was dealing with, cause I saw a lot of, uh, escalation of force things. I saw a ton of those types of situations coming up all over the country. And 
it was very eye opening because if you remember, they put us in those situations of, you know, okay, they have a knife, you have a gun. What do you do? There's one way to go and look at it. Okay, now they're running at you. Do you have enough time to think about what's going on? Um, those real world scenarios um, from a legal standpoint helped. I can't say change my perspective, but it definitely shifted to look more realistic, which I, I love that training. And uh, yeah, I would do it again because I just had too much fun with it. Yeah, um, no, for sure. I did like it. And then I did it again in 2014 before I went to Afghanistan, but it was at Camp Gernsney. And mm-hmm. it, it wasn't CAS JA, it was the regular CAS, but they had implemented those um, active shooter scenarios. Right. Um, because, yeah, in Afghanistan, before going to Afghanistan, those are really, are really important and valuable because, you know, you never know who can be the active shooter. And they actually had a, re- a really serious, bad one in Afghanistan, too. So. Right, right, right. Uh, but if you don't mind just taking a moment to to just kind of talk about, you know, give us your background and kind of like your journey, uh, you know, through your Air Force career. No, no, no worries at all. Uh, and I apologize. I tend to go all over the place. I like to talk. Um, that's all good. Yeah, that's perfect. So, um, yes, Tom Hamilton. Um, I joined the Air Force in 1996. I was a... Uh, a weapons bomb loader for the first uh, almost nine and a half years of my career. Um, started off at Davis Monthan Air Force Base loading A-10, uh, which I absolutely loved. Um, loved that aircraft, still love that aircraft to this day. Um, did a one-year remote tour at uh, Kunsan Air Base Korea. Worked F-16s there, and then I came back and uh, went back to Davis Monthan to work A-10. Right around um, 2003, um, I think that's when I was starting to, you know, get a little bit closer to growing up, um, started settling down a little bit. And that is when I met, uh, my now wife, Christina. And, um, at, you know, as things got very serious between her and I, we got married and, uh, uh we came pregnant with our son, Nick. And, uh, she kind of gave me the, you know, I'm tired of you, uh, deploying and uh, working with explosives every single day. So I think you need to do something else. And so believe it or not, I, uh, got asked from my, uh, my fighter squadron to go be a bailiff or a court martial of some folks out of, uh, my squadron, which, you know, thankfully I didn't know the guys, they weren't in uh, my weapons flight, but, uh, I went over there and, um, to the 355th wing legal office. And I sat through and I was a bailiff for two uh, drug court martial cases. And I remember sitting there thinking that it was the most fascinating thing ever. Just, you know, listening to the procedure, listening to how everything was going on. Um, it was, and I remember, uh, the ADC's name, uh, or actually, no, he was the, um, uh, uh, trial counsel there, uh, Captain Jeff Black, um, no, now long, but retired, I believe. And I remember talking with him, um, it was a uh, staff sergeant Lopez at that time, uh, Ricardo Lopez, I think is, is his name. And I talked to them and I thought, you know, wow, this is really interesting. And I remember I went home and I talked to my wife thinking, you know, Hey, this is really, you know, this is really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so um, I started the process to, uh, to cross train um, to which everybody in my weapons fly thought I was absolutely crazy because, you know, going from maintenance to become a paralegal. Um, I tend to uh, talk a lot. I tend to say a lot of what's on my mind and that didn't necessarily translate to an office environment uh, from their point of view. But uh, I, I went over to the legal office. I went through all the steps, took the test. Uh, I remember it was my wife when I was putting together my retraining package gave, is the one who gave me the suggestion of why don't you put it in a binder? Why don't you tab it? And I was, and to me that at that point in time, I'm like, boom, wow. What, what an amazing idea. Right. So, uh, in two, I was 2005 and so cross trained in 2005 and went from there to, uh, San Angelo and a uh, good fellow air force base, which was my first base as a paralegal. Um, Definitely the, the training environment was awesome. We did a lot of court martials. We did a lot of Article 15s, um, which, of course, is where I initially dropped into. Also had uh, a, an office there that uh, what was turned into my standard almost of what I looked at in terms of an, of an office. Uh, we took such great care of each other that we would not only work together, but we would have game nights together. We would 
um, hang out you know, off duty. We would do all sorts of uh, things together. Um, it, it was an incredible group, but we also, at the same time, we worked really, really, really hard. Um, you know, in that ATC environment, you're you know talking little good fellow. There's four of us in military justice. Uh, we're doing a 130 discharges, probably 120 Article 15s, and still pushing about 12 to 15 court martials. And like I said, that was a section of three paralegals and one discharge clerk. Um, Granted, and um, I always preface it with, it was a different time. Um, It was a different time in the JAG Corps where um, a lot of things were, um, you had guilty pleas, you had judge alone. There weren't necessarily as many things, in my opinion, that were uh, fully litigated as the cases that we have now. So um, we we had a lot of what I used to refer to as... uh, Tra- training court marshals almost where if you had a guilty plea judge alone you could go through the motions and you can learn that process because uh, my opinion still to this day is once you learn that basis basic process of a uh, court martial it didn't matter if you were doing guilty plea judge alone it didn't do matter if you're doing a murder case it was still the same pieces it was just going in different ways right and so i got a lot of experience um doing that at goodfellow um Hopped around a lot, did uh, did general law, did uh, did deployment lines, did everything. And um, towards the end of that is when I got to do my uh, 365 uh, tour to Afghanistan, where I was the uh, the NCOIC of the um, legal advisor office to uh, U.S. Forces Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, wasn't really sure what I was walking into then, but uh, um, I ended up working. Uh, Right across the way from then, it was uh, General McChrystal, who was running the the campaign over there. Um, after the unfortunate incident that happened with uh, Rolling Stone magazine in a particular article, um, I watched McChrystal fly out of there and General Petraeus come in, where um, I, I got an opportunity to meet him. In fact, uh, um, one of the cool things I got to do over there is um, I did uh, General Petraeus's power of attorney, so his wife could move from Tampa up to the DC area since he was gone. Um, one of those crazy things that you didn't even really think about. Um, that, that was, um, that, that, that year over there probably opened my eyes up more to the, the bigger military world um, that was out there, especially uh, being in a combatant command like uh, US forces Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where I met Joey over there. Um, he, he, he was just the same person that he is now. Um, absolutely awesome. And had the heart of gold. Um, let's see. So I have, um, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I have a confession to make. <laughs> What's that? I don't think I ever told you about this. Um, but I, when I got to Afghanistan, I think it was your old position. I think it was your old spot, but it was just six months. And mm-hmm. I found uh, an EP, I think it was an EPR that you had or something like that. And that was gold <laughs> for me because I was able to, at that time, I wasn't a very good writer. Mm-hmm. So in order to kind of see, you know, the things just we did, um, I was doing claims. I'm not sure if you were doing claims there at the time um, at, you know, headquarters, ISAF, mm-hmm. uh, convoys. We were doing, you know, driving outside the wire. Uh, a lot of different different things that I was able to to pull from that. So, so I did a uh, I, I did a uh, I did quite a few convoy type missions there. Yes, um, um, funny enough that you mentioned that you went and you stole from me. Uh, the one of the people that uh, was there before me was a then master sergeant Larry Tolliver, who uh, I found a video of him over there. Uh, doing a Christmas greeting, which I really wish I would have got my hands on because uh, that would have been really fun to use that against them at some point. But um, yeah. it, that that was an, an eye-opening time over there to be able to get exposed to something at that level and, and certainly that mission. Right. And it, it put a lot of things in perspective, I think, just um, career-wise, life-wise, mm-hmm. to be able to be a part of something that big. Mm-hmm. Um it was incredible. So, um, 
my reward from uh, from doing that 365, um, I was able to come back and um, I went to Hickam Air Force Base. Well, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam at that point, it just switched over and I got to do three years there. Um, the, the, the crazy thing about all this, and I have been, I had been absolutely lucky in terms of you know, promotions as I've moved along. Um, I've never purposely went out of my way to try to do anything to say, I'm going to do this so I can get promoted. Um, I've always been a stickler of, I'm going to do what I think is right. And if things happen to work out, awesome. If they don't, I can still sleep at night knowing that I'm doing best by myself, best by my family. But I, I got very, very lucky in terms of that. Um, I had a line number for um, um, tech sergeant when I cross trained. So I got to Goodfellow and I put on tech sergeant. Um, I left Goodfellow, um, I think it was probably a month after I sewed on master sergeant leaving Goodfellow. I left Hickam. I went there and um, I initially was there. I, I was the NCIC of military justice. That was back when it was a true single base GCM where um, the wing commander was a GCMCA. So we were doing both spe special and general court marshals doing math and base level all at the same time. So my background from Goodfellow helped me out a ton there. But um, eventually the law office superintendent retired. I moved into the law office superintendent role. Um, got to the end of my three years and I shockingly found out I somehow made senior. So, um, <laughs> My, my last uh, four months that I was at uh, Hickam, I flew back for, um, it was the end of December, I think it is, is for our sexual assault conference that we had at Maxwell. Flew back to Hickam for two weeks and then flew back for the Senior NCO Academy. Flew back again and five days later I out processed and then I went to um, Air Force District of Washington where uh, I got to be the command paralegal manager there for probably about a year and a half until um, I had a very, very crazy conversation with uh, then Chief Oliver and Chief Stout when they asked me what I thought about uh, working JAI, which um, I, I, I thought that was a, uh, I, I thought that was a very humbling that they thought of me. I went out and I, I did a couple of uh, inspections at augmentee, but uh, I, I, I've, I've told the story a couple of times. So um so I remember very clearly we're sitting down and we're having lunch you know, after a get together we had in, in um, at Andrews and they asked me what did I think about JAI and I was like um, I've never thought about JAI and uh, Chief Stout Chief Stout excuse me in his normal way of being very blunt and very direct he looked at me and said you know if I was to ask you if you want to do JAI uh, would you do it and I said do I have to give an answer right now he said if I ask you right now if you want to do it are you going to do it. I'm like, well, if I have to give you an answer right now, my answer is no. And I remember both him and Chief Oliver were like, you know, kind of leaned back a little bit. And my response was, before I make a decision like that, I have to go and ask my wife. Mm -hmm. There's a, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do this, I want to make sure I can put everything into it. I'm going to travel a lot. I'm going to see a lot of people. I'm going to see some great things. I know I'm going to see some not great things. I want to make sure that she's on board. And then I remember they said, okay, then we think you're the right person for that. Get back to us. Awesome. Yeah. And I thought that was very, very awesome. Yeah. Um, so then I went on that journey. Um, I think I, I did almost 50 inspections for JAI. I went all around the world, um, Europe, multiple times in Europe, uh, Japan, Japan was awesome. Um, <laughs> Korea, um, all, all over, um, all over the U S of course, Whiteman was one of the places that I went to. So I got a chance to see Knob Noster in the B2s. Right. Um, and uh, I, I, I didn't have any real plan after that. I didn't know what was going on. In fact, um, originally when I was talking to Chief Stout at that point in time, it was uh, the plan was I asked to go down to the schoolhouse because uh, I had said, I said, I either want to go to the schoolhouse or I want to go to one of the big uh, law office superintendent's jobs because where else could I go and take all this experience? You know, send me to a Lackland, send me to a Ramstein, send me somewhere where I can use all this experience to, to be good. And um, originally I was going to try to go down to the schoolhouse to be able to go and help, you know, bring in some of this, these lessons learned into the curriculum there, you know, to help better prepare. And um, then I found out I made chief which totally like threw everything off kilter of, 
you know, all right. I, <laughs> and I remember when uh, Chief Chief Stout's the one who told me, and I remember uh, he, uh, he he said, you know, hey, can you give me a call? And I so I gave him a call, and I'm like, okay, man, what's going on? <laughs> and, you know, he talked, and, you know, and his, he, he was joking with me, toying with me as he normally did. Um, and then he said, you know, I just wanted to call, uh, wanted to call and let you know that, um, that plan about sending you down to the schoolhouse, that plan is not going to work anymore. And as soon as he said that, I'm like, Oh, geez. <laughs> so, um, yeah, from, from there, um, from there, that, that, that group of chief, uh, people that I made chief with, um, it, it absolutely blows me away to this day because um, there's there's so many incredible folks out there, and the fact that I I made it that point it, uh, it it absolutely stuns me. Um, that was the year. Um, you have uh, Chief Jenny Green who made it that year. Um, Chief uh, Shari uh, Calhoun who's now uh, retired, but uh, you also had a uh, uh, Chief Mass Sergeant Ralph Oliver who made it that same year as well. Um, who of course he's you know among all the other folks, he's also doing incredible things right now too. So, uh, you know, as we got split up going across all over the place, uh, you know, chief Oliver got, uh, you safety and uh, I know he loved it there. Um, chief, chief green, if I remember right, she, she stayed around, uh, I know she was at Whiteman for a while before she went down to global strike. Um, Calhoun of course went to ATC and then I got to go to ACC which um, if it wasn't for the fact of everything I did JAI and all the stuff that I got to learn from, you know, not only looking at it from the wing levels, but the NAF levels when we did the NAF inspections and then the interactions I had with all the chiefs constantly, if it wasn't for that experience, um, I think I probably would have burned down ACC more than I maybe did. <laughs> I hope it's still going great. I hope I really <laughs> didn't mess anything up there. Um, um, but um, I, I did three and a half years at um, ACC before um, before I retired, and um, ACC was a monster. It was a beast, but holy moly, the, the mission um, the, the mission was absolutely phenomenal. Watching the people and the things that they did to get the missions done, whether it be you know our Northcom folks that were down during um, um, the hurricane, um, Hurricane Michael. Tyndall Air Force Base, if I remember right. Um, right. That, that, that um, Colonel Ecton and I were watching live on TV when that was going on, and we I remember we looked at each other going, oh no, something bad is really happening. Um, you have the Southcom and everything that they've gone, you know, taken down in South America. Um, it, it's, in, it's phenomenal. Um, going after um, AFCENT, their AOR. Um, it, it made me proud every day to know that I could be their representative to try to take care of them because every time I, I got a chance to talk to them and interact with them, they were just absolutely killing it. So uh, when it came to what I'm doing now, um, it, it, it made it very hard to walk, to, you know, walk away. But um, at the same time too, um, the timing for everything for me and my family were just right. And so um, I'll fill in the rest of the story for, you know, the folks uh, to where, yes, I am a 1L at the, the University of Oklahoma College of Law, um, working my way towards my Juris Doctor degree, because um, back when I was a good fellow, I did magistrate court. And the only reason why the district um, judge didn't think that I was attorney was because I told him I was an attorney. I did everything else. And from that moment on, I knew that I could do this. And so... Mm -hmm in my retirement, that's my intention of what I'm going to try to do. Right. Awesome. That's really good though. Yeah. Um, so I heard, I think I heard from Sergeant Quinto. He's the one who told me that you were, um, you know, mm -hmm. that you were pursuing a law degree and, and that's awesome too. <laughs> um, you know, it's retiring and just moving along and now let's get to that, you know, to that level of, you know, that we know, I think as paralegals, we kind of can, cause like you said, we, we handle mostly, everything else the only thing we just can't do is litigate but there's confidence in that we can you know we can accomplish that so that's you uh, know i'm definitely really proud of you for doing that oh absolutely the, my my only regret about it honestly is a lot of the skills that i had back when i was a seven level back when i you know rubber meets the road when i was doing a lot of that a lot of those skills that that i was exercising then 
I wish I could have held on to him a little bit longer because unfortunately, you know, the bad part about uh, getting promoted is that you get further and further away from the actual work aspect of the paralegal of the JAG. You can still talk it. You still understand it. You still have the big picture of it. But um, for instance, right now, uh, one of my classes, I'm doing legal research and writing. And um, a lot of the stuff we're doing for the research side of it is me digging into the blue book and doing blue book citations. And I'm going into Lexis and I'm going into Westlaw. And I'm and I was thinking, you know, wow, this is a lot like seven level school. I remember when I had to sit at the um, the Capitol building in uh, Montgomery and we're digging through all the books and we're doing all these things. But seven level school for me was. 2007 so 13 years ago right. i wish some of those skills were a little bit more fresh but it, it's slowly coming back right yeah absolutely no that's really cool yeah no i remember that time that was really awesome and uh i can definitely imagine being taken back there um <laughs> once again like deja vu like oh yeah i've done this <laughs> mm -hmm. in the past uh, um, especially one of our folks is a um a um prior um, Air Force JAG as well. And so one of the uh, research things she had us do was going and looking up at the UCMJ. So I thought that was hilarious because I didn't even have to look it up. I already knew what article she was referring to, but I figured, okay, I'll play the game right now and do this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, so looking back at your career again, because I remember, again, if we go back to 2009, uh, you, were, you were a technical sergeant. You were a tech mm -hmm. sergeant at the time. Did you have a line number when you went through CATS for master? I did not. Um, I I tested. Uh, that was a particular year where um, it was uh, PFE only. And so when I got over to Afghanistan, I studied and studied, and I purposely picked my uh, my mid tour to be at the very end of May. It was exactly six months through. Um, it coincided with my wife's birthday, so that of course made her very happy. <laughs> But um, I also made the decision because I didn't want to go and put it off. Um, I tested supplemental during my mid tour. Right. So the first half of when I was over in Afghanistan, um, when I had the time, I was studying because I wanted, I wanted to take that one test. Right. And so I, I found out, I found out, I think, with the supplemental release. So I was still in Afghanistan when I found out I had lined up for master sergeant. Okay. All right. Because I just remember seeing you a cast and then blinking, and then you were a chief master sergeant. Now, I don't, <laughs> I don't, obviously that's not how it happened to you, but that's how it happened to me, right? Like, wait a second, he's a chief? Well, you're yeah. a staff sergeant, and now here you are, you're a master sergeant. Well, right, 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 right. right. It's, it, it appears that I've been moving along since that, um, since that deployment as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't know if it's, like to me, it was, you know, a little more eye-opening and made me more, um, I, I don't want to say responsible, but it definitely made me appreciate more of what, um, you know, the career field. I appreciate, like, really seeing the ops law side of it. And, like, I already, I was all in on, on being a paralegal, but that was just a, a different side that when, when I came back to my home station, mm -hmm. it was just a different hunger that was there um, for wanting to, um, you know, to, to, to apply those things that were learned in Afghanistan and to, uh, and to continue progressing. So, yeah. Oh, w without a doubt. Um, you know, the, the two pivotal things that I know when it came to my career was, um, 9-11, um, 9-11, I was a staff sergeant and, um, I, in fact, uh, just when it came to some of my classmates on 9-11, um, I'm, I'm part of the military law society, go figure here for, um, OU. And uh, talking to them, I said, you know, that's when I know the military changed from a job to so a something a whole lot more for me. And so that really drove me and motivated me. And then um, my time in Afghanistan and even how um, how I ended up over there into Afghanistan, um, you know, it was uh, Chief Stocks who uh, um, uh, picked me to be able to go over there and pretty much gave me the... Um, I'm, we're going to let you do this because uh, it was supposed to be a master sergeant position. They're mm -hmm. letting me go as a tech. And so it was kind of one of those, we're, we're picking you to let you do this. Don't let us down. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> 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 but um, I, I, I can only, 
any of the excess I have that I've I had in my military career, it came down to I think two things really in my head. Um, the people around were always taking care of me, and I always did my best to try to take care of them. Right. Um, and that's that's what it's all about. It's about taking care of each other. Um, I had I've had some great leaders. I've had some horrible leaders. And I had everything in between. I've learned as much as I can. Um, but we've always tried to take care of each other, which was, you know, the best thing at all. And then the other thing is certainly no matter, um, you hear the, the saying, you know, grow where you're planted, no, no matter the situation of what, you know, you get put into, you always try to do the best you can. Um, you never want to be the person of, you know, I'm going to wake up today and figure out how I'm going to screw everything up. Um, mm -hmm. how are you going to go and make things better? How are you going to go and, you know, improve a little bit, you know? In Afghanistan, one of the crazy things that I did that, uh, you know, my, my SJ, he was an army SJ over there. He thought it was absolutely nuts, but I did it. Um, tax season was coming up and, you know, us in the air force, we always have our tax center. Well, you're not going to necessarily have a tax center at, uh, you know, high ISAF headquarters, but, um, I created a SharePoint. I created a little page. I started referring people to military one source. Um, my, my father is a retired accountant. Mm -hmm. And so every once in a while, I'd have people come over and I would just kind of walk them through the simple stuff. Um, but it was things like that to keep me busy, mm -hmm. taking care of other folks that did, did it help? Sure. But did I do it because I wanted to get promoted? Absolutely not. I did because it's the right thing to do. Right. Yeah, no, that, um, just like you said, right, taking care of people, people taking care of you being put in situations that I never thought I would be right. That just mm -hmm. makes us a little stronger and see things a little differently. Like, right. Like I was taking college classes while I was in Afghanistan. Right. I took four, mm -hmm. four classes um, because I thought, you know, I didn't know how busy I was going to be. I was way busier than I thought. Um, but I found <laughs> myself studying while being in, the, you know, like in an up armor SUV, Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm checking for, you know, like threats and stuff like that and just waiting in the vehicle and I'm here on my iPad studying, reading <laughs> because I have paper due that night. Um, mm -hmm. So now whenever, you know, people try to question, you know, question whether or not it's possible to do school and work, and like it's possible. <laughs> it's absolutely possible. I, I graduated. I finished my last class for my bachelor's degree. I turned in, I, I was doing a weather class. This was my final class for my bachelor's degree. I finished a PowerPoint presentation. I, I already coordinated with my teacher while I was sitting at the, uh, oh, Four Point Sheraton in Baltimore at the airport, getting ready to hop on my rotator to get to Afghanistan. I turned in my final PowerPoint from there. And then once I flew out to Afghanistan, I had to do like my final proctor thing where I had a, uh, She's now retired to uh, Air Force uh, retired Colonel Amy Bechtel. She was um, a military judge, but she was out there at the same time. She proctored my final exam while I was out there in Afghanistan to where I graduated while I was out there. Nice. So totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, yes, it, it's very, very hard, but um, it, it, it's a pro if you want to make it a priority, you absolutely can. Right. You can. And, and the other piece of taking care of people um, mm -hmm. Because we, it's a two men, whenever we went out on the convoy, it was a two, two vehicle convoy. And we had, you know, three, four people per vehicle sometimes. Um, we, I, I had to be ready. Like I couldn't be a liability on the road. Like I had to know the, I had to know the route. I had mm -hmm. to be in shape. I had to know how to handle my weapon. I had to know that if a vehicle broke down, how do we get out quickly to make sure that we can get out of there safely? Like I had the full trust in all of my, you know, my teammates and my family, um, that we were going to be safe. And I just, mm -hmm. that just taught me, you know, something, some other things that you can continue to apply later on, but just, you know, the, the fact that you don't want to ever be a liability or a burden on someone else. And this was, you know, more of a matter of life and death type situation, but in any other situation, um, could be it applied as well. Just always be prepared um, to at least, at least do our role and then do it well. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, the, the people that I spent time over there with um, to this day, 
I am still extraordinarily close with um, my SGA from uh, there. Um, he, he ended up leaving, unfortunately, when General McChrystal was fired, but uh, he, he moved on to uh, better things. Uh, he's now uh, retired uh, Brigadier General Rich Gross, who went from there to become the uh, the CENTCOM SJA mm -hmm. to where from there he was handpicked. Um, he was uh, the legal counsel to the chairman of the Joint Chief, uh, General Dempsey. Oh. That was the last time I saw him in uniform. Mm -hmm. um, my other SJA uh, retired uh, um, Marine Colonel um, Mike Jordan, who, like I said, th these are people that I drove around that city. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought it was funny when people uh, mistook me as uh, their personal security detail, which right. I mean, yeah. okay, yeah, I'm six foot, I push about 200 pounds, and throw me some body armor, I can look pretty mean, but I'm like, I'm still a paralegal. Mm -hmm. But um, they took care of me, and um, to this day, for any of the folks out there, I would probably still take a bullet for because we took care of each other. And I know for a fact too, it's vice versa. Um, and that's the level of bonding. And mm -hmm. I know the folks who have been in out there, they totally understand what that level of bond is about. Right. Yeah. I had a Navy SJ, uh, Captain McCarthy. Um, and I went to him whenever I enrolled in my master's degree for a letter of recommendation. And I went to him and asked for, for a letter of recommendation. And he, you know, mm -hmm. he's like, yeah. So always, you know, even goes past that, just taking care of uh, continuing to uh, to want to support in everything that it is that we do. So um, one thing that I wanted to ask you that is interesting. You're really going to have to edit this together. I can already feel it because we're going. All over the place. It's all good. This is good. Uh, <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask you about your background as well mm -hmm. is your. So, again, your maintenance background. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from weapons and how or what how long did it take you to adjust i guess into being a paralegal did you have any growing pains or um how was that transition so i i had a i had a pretty rough transition in some in some points um the the one thing and some of it comes from the maintenance background some of it came from uh just being the son of my father, um, almost a brutal honesty to an extent. Um, and as a paralegal, kind of learning how to temper that a little bit more. Um, sometimes you, um, you don't have to be the bull in the china shop. Sometimes you don't have to say necessarily what's on everybody's mind because it's already there. Um, when I cross-trained, uh, my first NCYC of uh, military justice, a uh, guy by the name of, he's now retired, Brandon O'Neill, he was a former ammo guy. And so for the maintainers out there who uh, understand the relationship between ammo and weapons, um, don't ever say that somebody whose weapons is ammo and vice versa. Never call somebody whose ammo weapons. Um, we, we will fight with each other. We make fun of each other constantly. And um, that, that is just the way it is. But um, he was an ammo um, staff sergeant before he cross trained. And so it was, I think it was a little bit of an advantage because he at least understood my, my mentality coming out, understanding that he was going to have to help shape me and uh, my temperament on how I went and dealt with things. Um, you know, I was used to dealing with uh, the pilots sometimes. And a lot of times when it came to the pilots, brutal honesty was the only way that you could get through with them. You know, with all due respect, sir. Well, actually, I don't even think when I was in the maintenance world, I even started with all due respect. Uh, if a pilot came back and said it's a code three for a hung gun, my response would be after I looked over everything, um, sir, the problem's you. Right. That doesn't go over very well. But um, <laughs> and, and so it, it took it took a long time to be able to go and kind of um, you know t temper that um, as I was going through the paralegal career field. Um, there was multiple times where I've had people pull me to the side and talk to me, you know. You know, Tom, you can't say that. Tom, you shouldn't say that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, it, it was a different world for me because um, when it came to the weapon side, sometimes immediate action, immediate abrupt action was what was needed to sometimes save somebody's life. Um, you know, for instance, and I've used this analogy before, if somebody was going and trying to uh, put up a bomb during an integrat combat turn and they put their hands in between the, the bomb and the, and the, um, 
in the weapons rack, if that thing settles when it's refueling and you get your hands you know, crushed, there's a reason why there's a warning in the technical orders when it comes to that permanent injury or death. There's a reason when as a, you know, a load supervisor, when you're doing that stuff, when you see those things, there's not going to be a, um, hold on. I need you to stop what you're doing right now because what you're doing is going to get hurt. The reaction is more of a, you take, you grab, you pull, Hey, do you realize that you could have just really jacked yourself up? Um, so it's a different way of thinking. Um, in the paralegal world, you know, though what we do is very, in, in the JAG world also, excuse me, um, is extremely important. I mean, we're, in some cases, we're taking away uh, liberty from individuals, we're affecting people's career. Um, absolutely. And it's something that needs to be, you know, taken very seriously. Um, is there any piece of paperwork that I've ever seen that uh, somebody's life is hanging on the line? Maybe after multiple, multiple levels of review. Um, I came across people who would go and freak out because of typos. Well, you don't need to freak out. You need to teach. That, that's what you need to do. Um, and it, and it, it takes a little bit to switch the mentality around, but also the maintenance background gave me um, a lot of different perspective that I think sometimes um, it helped. So, sometimes it hurt. Um, especially when I would get, when I, um, as, as I became more senior and um, sometimes I, we would go and have some really, really tough conversations. And when we were having those tough conversations, that was when sometimes my old maintainer would come out of, you know what, we're all dancing around the point. I'm just going to flat out say it right now, this is what's going on. You know, people aren't happy or something along this line. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, does it make people mad and does it rub people the wrong way? Absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, if you don't, I think I'm, I hope I'm allowed to say this on this podcast. If you don't piss people off every once in a while, you're not doing your job. Right. You, you have to be able to stand up for what you think is right. And um, it, it took both sides of my maintenance paralegal personality to kind of navigate through that. Um, it's hard. It's hard learning. And um, sometimes you kind of go from one extreme to the other where, you know, you want to say something, but you don't want to say anything. But then somebody who knows you sees that you want to say something, which I always gave everything away on my face. Um, I was horrible with my poker face. So, um, it's, um, it, it can be done. Um, believe it or not, I, I've seen a lot of prior maintainers be extremely successful. Um, he, he never advertised it though. I made fun about it. Uh, chief Bo Stout, he was a weapons guy. He only did one term as a weapons person, but, um, he, he had it in him a little bit. Um, I, I think a lot of the leadership lessons that you learn being in those situations out on the flight line, um, the fact that the load crew, I had two individuals at that point. I had, I had two people who outranked me until I sewed on staff sergeant um, for my first load crew and learning how to talk to two people and be able to guide, train and mentor them when they outranked you. That was hard, but I learned so much more. <laughs> um, you, you can't lead with this or this. It, it, it takes more. It takes this and it takes that. That's right. Yeah. And we don't, a lot of times we don't really see it that way. We just think that, Hey, you got to do it because I'm telling you to do it. Ah, uh, that's not, mm, a lot of times it's just not going to work. Right. If, if it's not, you know, being uh, conveyed in the right manner and for the right reasons. Um, there, there are so many vines. There's so many things in terms of leadership that I learned from all the different things. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to go via the rank of, you know, you know, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know, we're going to press on, go forward. Um, and I remember that uh, as a bomb loader, when we were in, um, cause I did a um, Kuwait and Afghanistan trip when I was a bomb loader as well. And um, I had a individual, a two man, he just now retired. I saw it on Facebook shows how old I'm getting, but um, he, uh, he just now retired. He, um, there, he was very much a mouthy person. He was ma more mouthy than I think than I am, if believe it or not. And there was multiple times where I had to look at him and say like, man, Adam, shut up. And in about two hours, I will sit down and explain all this to you in, in, in 
So you completely get what we're doing. But for right now, I need you to trust me. Trust me and follow me. And he did. Um, you, you still owe people the explanation sometimes, but at the, at the same time, you have to temper it, especially in a military construct with, I'm here for a reason. I didn't just roll in here as a staff sergeant. I went through all the steps too. I need you to believe me and trust me. Um, and I think that's a really hard part about leadership is to, to get the people around you to be able to look you in the eye and they believe in you and you can make them believe that what we're doing is right. Right. No, absolutely. Um, very good point. One observation that I had in ALS though, you know, as we, as we talk about different cultures and different career fields, um, these ALS students, <laughs> the more I saw them and interacted with them, um, I guess this new, uh, well, I don't want to really want to say generation or categorize, but they were really blunt. That's one thing that I noticed. <laughs> and, you know, me as a master sergeant being in the classroom, it really didn't phase them. Like to me, like me, whenever I went to ALS back in 2009, um, and if a master sergeant would have been in the classroom, I had a staff sergeant instructor, but if I had a master sergeant, like, I don't know, you know, if I would have been as blunt as these students were being, <laughs> you know, uh, right. with me, they just, and it's not that they didn't care, but they just, now they're just not as, I don't want to say afraid, but they just don't see the rank as, as, as prior day. So, but, so they'll share you know, anything that whatever it's on their mind and they'll say it in the same manner that it's in their mind and then you're just going to come out. Um, so, and I saw it and it wasn't just like the maintenance career field, perhaps mm -hmm. maybe they gave the other one some courage, but it was from all career fields, medical, uh, finance, MP, MPF, they were all that blunt. Um, no, without a doubt. And People go, and I think it's a little bit to our detriment when we talk about, you know, the back in my day mentality and, you know, oh, you know, these airmen nowadays, they're, you know, they're nothing like us. You know, when I saw a master sergeant, you know, when I was an airman, I stood up, I was at attention, I was scared to death. Um, you know, and yes, I do remember that as well, too, because I, I remember the first time I got called in my flight chief's office uh, when I got to DM, I was an airman basic at the time, and uh, he called me in there, and I was scared out of my mind. <laughs> um, and, and, and the mentality of, you know, a lot of the airmen that we have coming in is very different. Um, so I think it's a bad thing. Well, I, I'm sure the people who uh, were the senior NCOs and um, the senior officers at our time thought it was a bad thing when we were coming in. Um, but I, I think it's a good thing. Um, I, I really, really do. They, they bring something different. Um, they bring a different look and a different mentality because we can never be, you know, we've always done it that way. Um, they, I, I love the bluntness, mm -hmm. respectful bluntness, um, I, I think is the best way to put it. You know, you, you can't say whatever's on your mind, but you can always temperament with, you know, give me the answer, yes or no. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, awesome. Tell me why it's no. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's appreciative. And you know, I've always appreciated that. Um, on the uh, the notorious uh, Airman NCO Senior NCO Facebook page, um, that was another one that I love to troll, but I think it almost looks like it's shut down right now. But um, there was a picture that somebody put out that I thought hit the nail absolutely on the head. Uh, and I'm, I I want to do the quote justice. We can't, you can't train your airmen the way that you were trained because you were trained for an Air Force that no longer exists. Right. And I remember reading that thinking, wow, because that's not only, you know, the technical competencies tend to stay the same, but a lot of it's the leadership lesson. Mm -hmm. And to be able to go and deal with a different type of personalities, to be able to almost morph yourself into the people, the person that needs to be for each of the individuals to be able to want to follow you versus trying to go and do the vice versa and say, well, I'm the person in charge, so you're going to go and yield mm -hmm. to me. It doesn't work. It absolutely does not work because if you try to make that work it creates animosity it creates low morale mm -hmm. um and these young airmen they'll, they'll hold all of us accountable they'll let you know what they're thinking right. i'm sure you saw that no yeah no that's all that and that's one thing i wanted to say is that i liked it um i like that approach and that they were doing that um and we could have easily or i could have easily said you know shut up in color because i'm saying it so you're not going to challenge me like that but 
it challenges you, it, you know, like, so now you're thinking differently and it's challenging us to actually come up with something that they can buy into. Because if mm-hmm. we just say, oh, no, shut up. You don't have any say in this. or You don't have any stake in this. Um, then how much trust are they really going to have in us? They're just going to say, all right, well, he's doing, you know, it, just pulling rank at this point. But mm-hmm. give me a reason to believe in you. Give me a reason to believe in your message. You know, give me a reason to buy into what it is that you're selling. Because right now I'm not. So you better come up with something else. Right. And, and, and you show the folks that you're willing to go to bat for them. You're willing able to take the time with them to invest in them. Um, the things that people will do are just absolutely amazing. Um, when, when you have a team that everybody trusts each other, that, that without a doubt is the cornerstone. There has to be trust. Um, if you have a team that trusts each other, the sky's the limit. Anything can get done. Um, in terms of, you know, putting in the context of a legal office, and I'll go down to the base legal office or even just a section, a military justice section. When you have a group of individuals where attorneys trust paralegals, paralegals trust the attorneys, everybody trusts, you know, the, the, the chain of command going up, the deputy SJA, the SJA, um, everybody is working as one coherent unit of trust. Um, it doesn't matter if they're running 30, 40, 50 court marshals through. It, it can work like a machine. Now, granted, you're not going to do 30, 40, 50 court marshals unless you have the manning, you know, right. the, the, the manning pretty good. But at the same time, um, it, it, it makes people want to be a part of something bigger versus looking at that clock wondering, when can I go home? Right. Which, I mean, and granted, um, and I never want to, you know, downplay this as well. You have to have a work-life balance. You have to spend time with your family. Um, one, one of the greatest quotes I still got from, it was a senior mass sergeant when I was at Hickam. She got offered, her um, husband was a officer and uh, he had to go back to uh, Air War College and she was a senior mass sergeant. And uh, the career field called down and said to her, um, we're not gonna be able to get you to Maxwell, but we're gonna get you to Laughlin. She's like, what? And um, they said, if you go to Laughlin, that's going to put you in the position you're going to be able to make chief, no problem. Once that happens, we'll be able to go and try to get you together. And I remember she called all the superintendents together and her words she said is, you know what, what's the point of being a chief if nobody's at my retirement ceremony? Right. That uh, she got out as a senior, by the way. Yeah. She was absolutely incredible. And she got out as a senior because she got put in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I say that when it comes to the trust and the work, and I talk about the work and working hard, but at the same time, um, you, you have to put in the work on the family as well, because, um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I wouldn't be nowhere near where I am if it wasn't for my wife and my boys. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that is also like what's urgent and what's important, right? And mm-hmm. at some point we have to, you know, kind of draw the line and, and make it real, you know, detail the difference between what's urgent. Okay, it requires, I get it, it's hot mm-hmm. and everything like that, but what's really important, um, the things that I need to take care of and take care of the family because, you know, we're not always going to be wearing this, right? We go back to normalcy. <laughs> Um, and we do all we can and we serve our country honorably and with integrity and, and, and we sacrifice a lot and right, mm-hmm. we want to do the best that we can and have the biggest impact. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, we still have another life to live. Well, it, it was at my, uh, I, I was going through a bunch of old stuff and I found, uh, I wrote out my, uh, my speech for my promotion ceremony for chief because there's a lot of stuff I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. And, um, when I was talking to my boys, um, one of the things I, I, I read it the other day that uh, really stuck out, which is still very true, you know, for all the stuff that I've done, you know, when it comes to being in the military, you know, it's from Aaron Basic all the way up now to Chief Hamilton to, you know, being an airman and being um, a part of this. Um, there's still one title that is always the most important to me, and that's dad. Hmm. And I, I got my mom to cry when I said that too. So meant I did something good. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But I, I think that's one thing, you know, one message from this conversation that I would have for, for everyone else is to, you know, to make sure that we do understand that and not try not to kill ourselves so much to the detriment of 
you know, the people that have always been there for us, that support us and that even, you know, make it possible for us to show up to work every single day. There's going to be long, there's going to be hard nights. Sometimes there's going to be long nights. There's going to be, you know, a ton of work that has to get done. Um, had a great SJ who um, did PT at the very end of the day, um, three thirty. you had to go out. If you were going to go and not leave, you had to have a appointment with the first sergeant or commander or something along those lines. And if you still want to try to get out of it, you had to explain to him. And it taught all of us that we're so all type A personality. Um, I'm finding that out even still being in law school here that I'm, if I, if I let myself, I'm actually sitting at, this is my desk that I'm sitting at right now in my room. So to, to um, my left over here, I have all my school books set up. I have everything set up. And um, if I let myself, I could probably sit in here for 15, 16 hours a day. Um, but I don't. And I take his old advice where, you know, every once in a while I get up and I disconnect. And it's amazing sometimes with a little bit of perspective, you go, you know, that really can wait until tomorrow because it's always going to be there. You're never going to, you're never going to be able to go at, in a, any legal office or any work for that matter and say, done. No. It's always going to be there and you yeah. have to know when to do it. And um, paralegals need to make sure they pay attention to it. Um with their leadership looking out for it, Jags need to pay attention to it because I've seen some incredible Jags just get absolutely burned out. Mm -hmm. They want to go and they, they want to be, you know, the first person in the office. They want to be the last person out of the office. Um, they want their SJA to go and see that they're the one burning the midnight oil. Um, great. If you're working, you know, 16 hours a day. Um, but if you're putting in the, um, quantity without the quality, what's mm -hmm. the point? Right. Right. Yeah. Are you tackling those, you know, the, the actual things that need the attention right now and that need to be taken care of right now? And are they being done correctly? No, mm -hmm. I definitely, definitely agree. And, and like you said, we can knock out all the work that is at the legal office. You know, say we have the biggest work ethic and the best judgment to knock out the things that are important and get it all done today. Guess what? Tomorrow, two, three more new cases are going to come mm -hmm. by. So we can never catch, you know, truly, truly catch up to jump to it so we just gotta be judicious about when it is that we can say okay enough for today right and, and i will pa i'll pass this advice on to the folks out there because if you know this was one of my largest pet peeves that i had especially as an ncyc and military justice we always have our this, our packages there are things to do and we were always trying to get it done you want to get it to your ncyc for review so you can get it to your oic there was nothing more infuriating to me that when there was a package was due and my paralegal walked in at 4:35 to set it on my desk. Whew. All right. Been working all day on this. Got this, you know, got my referral package, got everything good to go. All right. Great. Uh, you need anything else from me? And the only thing that I'm sitting there thinking is, you know, actually I, I would have liked it about, you know, uh, like a, about 45 minutes ago mm -hmm. so I can get another 45 minutes of a good review of this back because after it goes to me, um, the OIC is waiting for it. it and not necessarily realizing the second and third and fourth order consequences mm -hmm. of it. Um, ha having some of that situational awareness. Now, granted, um, I never said anything to people. I would hope that my face facial <laughs> expression <laughs> kind of came across on it. But um, I, I think that's part of the trust and also the mutual respect with uh, where everybody's trying to get something done and everybody has, a, you know, has to be held accountable. Um, it only took once as an NCYC, and I think I only did it once, where I got a package from a paralegal, and I'm like, ah, they've been working on it all day, good to go, and I passed it along, and it got shredded. Mm -hmm. That reflects on me. So, uh, yeah, for anybody out there who's hearing this, uh, if, if you have a package or you have your to-do list, Try to get it done a little bit earlier to give the other folks who are trying to get, especially if you give me like, you know, if you gave it to me 45 minutes ago and there are issues, I can sit down and walk you through step by step. This is what's missing. This is what's needs. This is why it needs to be there, which training is a huge thing. Training is something that a lot of people I know talk about and training is an absolute focus. This is what part of this podcast is about. Um, that gives the time to be able to do that training versus me having to sit there and just changing it myself and not giving you the benefit of the experience that we earned. Right. So, 
Okay, so, I, I had to rant. I had to rant about that one. No, for sure. Yeah, and and that's the other. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's misunderstanding that when they give it. Well, you have the ability to make the changes, but it's like, but you're not. Lear- yeah, of course I can make all these changes. In fact, I can do your job. <laughs> but what good is that if? I'm doing everything and you're not because it's a matter of everyone learning, everyone knowing what to do, everyone being ready, you know, mm-hmm. and to replace ourselves as well. So you need that experience. You need that knowledge. You need to understand what's important, what isn't, you know, and, and what to look out for, for, for future um, instances. Oh, absolutely. Especially in a court martial case, going back to from the very beginning when we were talking the you know, the, the understanding of the process of knowing what pieces are there. Okay, you know, th- thank you for bringing me the Article 32 report. Do you have the receipts? Do you already serve it on people? Well, no, you can, you know, well, well why? Do you, do you know why you need to serve the 32 report? Do you know why that you need to serve it on them timely? Um, do you know why, and this is at least, you know, at that particular point in time from a JI standpoint, um, they're given five days to respond once you serve it. Don't you think you should at least give that to them within the five days that we expect them to be able to reply to us? you know, to, to give them the, the, the training of the why behind why we have to do certain things. Um, because it's, a, you know, especially in the court martial, it is a judicial part uh, process. It is a federal court with rules. And to understand why you're doing what you're doing, it, it, it gives a little bit more credibility, I think, to it of what they're doing. Good. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. And I definitely share your sentiments <laughs> with, with all that. And, you know, as a law office superintendent, we, you know, obviously see that a lot um, with right. managing the NCYCs and managing the paralegals and everything like that. So um, that's right. really important. So um, another thing I wanted to ask, and from your, from your experience as a, as a command paralegal manager, um, what were some of the big things that you remember that, you know, that, that you had to work either the hardest on or the things that troubled you or just in general, as far as the career field, um, from your perspective or from your command. So ACC was difficult because geographically it was everywhere. We had, uh, we had bases on the West coast. We had bases on the East coast. We had our folks out in Afton, which um, though Afton, um, tends to get lost sometimes and not, you know, people don't necessarily think about that being a part of ACC. It was. And so, you know, we had people um, that we had um, oversight responsibility, at least who were deployed, you know, Georgia, uh, Jordan, Aldafra, um, Kuwait, everything. And so the span of where everybody was at, that was always something that was really um, hard for me because the, the one thing that I, I always tried to do was about communication. Um, I, I, I purposely tried to over communicate where, um, I flipped the script of what some people do in terms of how they would go and push things out where my uh, distribution list was a distribution list to the law office superintendent. And then I CC'd the NAF paralegal managers. Um, I never left it for the NAF PMs to be able to go and send anything out to the, uh, to the law office superintendents because I, I, I was hoping to convey to them that I, they always have a direct line to me. And I'm going to utilize a direct line to them to let them know what's going on and try to give them as best the information as I can. Um, it got frustrating sometimes because, you know, sometimes I got more information from the base, the bases out there than I did from, you know, from the t- top. And I'm not necessarily talking about just Jack or, you know, specific stuff. Sometimes it was Air Force wide things that were going on where I was getting information from different things. And sometimes the base was quicker on the ball to be able to send stuff up. But I appreciated the fact that, you know, people were willing to share. Um, tr- trying to wrap my head around just the enormity of the beast of ACC was big. Um, you know, the different missions, the different things that were going on, um, the, the fighter missions, the, uh, the ISRW missions. Um, it, it took a lot of learning and it, I, I really learned how to, and I think general Rockwell um, talked about it when he went out uh, initially with chief Bose to do the, um, the visit, you know, he, he was listening. He, he, he was really, you know, he was trying to take in all the information. There's a lot of ACC that I did that. Um, it, it hurt me that uh, the one thing that got to me was 
I felt like I could never really do the personal touch that I wish I could have done with all the folks that's out there. Um, whether it be, you know, there's the people who definitely knew me that uh, they could have any level of conversation with me. Um, I, there are people out there that uh, um, I'm not necessarily saying they're, they're ACC, they could be anywhere, but there are some people that would reach out to me and say, I don't need to talk to Chief, I wanna to talk to Tom, please. And I was always completely, totally fine with that. Um, either way, they're going to get pretty much the same answer. Right. But, um, <laughs> but um, I, I, it was hard sometimes because I would go and try to do my best to, you know, to, to put myself out there to be able to have a real conversation to let people know I truly was genuinely interested in what was going on. And whether it was a trust issue or whether it was just, you know, oh, there's this crazy old chief who's trying to <laughs> ask me all these questions. You know, that, that was somewhat disheartening. Um, another thing, too, is when it came to making the tough decision. Um, th there were times where people wanted to deploy where I had to say, we can't do this right now. Um, I, I always try to push down the decision making level to the lowest one possible. You know, if, if your base can handle it, we'll support you. Well, if the NAF can handle it, we can support you. And there was very rare occasions where... Um, if it got to a certain point where I had to go and make the decision on it, I didn't like to do it, but it's something that I knew it, it, I knew in my heart that it had to be done. And what got to me, and I mean, some of this is just a self-conscious side of me is if somebody took it, the fact that I made the decision personal, um, none of my decisions that I ever made were ever personal. I was always trying to do it in the best interest of the air force. Um, I, I have a very, very close friend of mine who was with me out at Hickam, who uh, he and I have had some, you know, some brawls. Um, he, he got very angry with me. He's no longer in the military either. He got very angry with me because I wrote, I marked him down on his EPR. And when he called me up and said, because he was actually deployed at that point, he called me up and said, why'd you mark me down? I laid it out on him exactly why. He's like, oh man, you know, that, that's messed up, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, yo, I told you from the very get though. Business is business. And I've told you everything that you're hearing me say to you, I've said it to you over and over again. You know, whether you took that as from Tom or from Master Sergeant Hamilton, um, you need to figure that out. Um, that, you know, try, trying to give that level of, you know, feedback for folks. Um, I'm probably, I'm probably going all over the place. Um, ACC. You're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're good. This is, this is valuable stuff for sure. Um, some of the, some of the interesting things to be able to go and definitely be a part of, um, you know, being close to DC, I got the opportunity to go up there and see a lot of different things. Um, I got an opportunity to give a, um, a justice briefing to the, the command chief, um, selects, um, a few years ago. I did that with a now a retired Colonel uh, Cordova, which that was awesome. That was a very, um, humbling experience to be able to stand up there, certainly with Colonel Cordova, but also in front of uh, Chief Wright and everybody to be able to go and say, hey, yeah, I'm a paralegal, but I'm also a fellow chief. And let me tell you a little bit about the military justice stuff and how to deal with things. Um, that, that was freaky. Um, the, the opportunity to, uh, and I know this is going to sound cliche if you're a, um, you're a fan of Hamilton, but uh, the song, The Room Where It Happens, um, it, was, it was a humbling experience to be able to sit in that room and to be able to go and get the feedback from the folks and the voices and to be able to uh, be that person to express, you know, you know, I know we're concentrating on this and this is what we're trying to do, but this is what the foot people are, you know, are yelling for. This is what they want to see from us. And, you know, we might not be able to deliver everything, but let's deliver something. Um, that that was that was interesting and humbling and everything all at the same time. Um, I think everybody uh, who was sitting in the room for our last uh, UNTW. This was uh, May of oh, was that May of 2019. Yeah, I think May that was May of 2019 uh, with Chief Bose and Chief Oliver and all of us sitting in that room. Uh, the, the new CFETP that's now coming online and everything that you guys are seeing. We worked. So 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 hard um, to try to make that right 
um, for everybody to go and bring take our um, the career field up to another level. Um, the fact that I got an opportunity to be a part of that is um, it's awesome. Now, are there going to be folks out there who are going to roll their eyes and say whatever? And you know, why'd you add this? Why'd you add that? Um, yes, because I was the same person who said that years and years ago. But you know what? Um, if it inspires one person, one paralegal, one anybody out there to be a little bit uh, better paralegal and better airman, 100% worth it. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a lot of good information. Um, <laughs> just in there right now <laughs> and all the different challenges that, um, that we're dealing with now with, you know, with the legal office, with different commands, with different missions, because that's one thing that I'm struggling here at Whiteman. I'm not saying that I'm struggling per se, but I'm still, you know, it's, it's definitely my first time in a global strike. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, you know, I, I was a mobility command when I was a young airman, so I didn't really think that big, never thought operational or strategic <laughs> level at all. So to me, really, I mean, my, my time at McDill, I wouldn't right. really say that I, I took the time to understand the mission because it wasn't an interest of mine as an A1C. Uh, but then AETC, PACAF obviously was, you know, definitely a big mission. But being PME, the mission, obviously, you, you, you try to make it, get everyone linked up together to understand why all of our career, the professional, professional of arms, you know, right. why is it important? Why is every career field important? and everything like that. But Global Strike just provides uh, such a different challenge um, as a law office superintendent to me who I'm not, I'm not used to the mission. So I'm trying to get out there mm -hmm. and talk to different people um, because I think that that's important for the paralegals to also understand the impact that we have and that every time that we have an article 15 or we have an investigation, the damage that that's causing, you know, especially if we have delays, if, we, if we're not being diligent in processing the Article 15 or in the preferral, the referral, and, and, and getting the case docketed and everything like that, like the damage that's causing to the base, because, I mean, they're not been whole. They know that they're not been whole. They can't mm -hmm. use this airmen right now, and they can't gain someone because they're still in their books. So it's huge um, to be able to link that together. So I had a um, I, I had an experience very very early in my paralegal career that, uh, in in retrospect, helped kind of put a lot of the pieces together to me because you know I, I think sometimes uh, folks in the legal office do get lost in the fact of you know where do I fit in you know they think they you know oh, great I got to work the front desk again <sighs> uh, I never personally was a fan of the front desk because I just that that <laughs> but. Weirdly enough, I was always the one they put out there, especially when it came to difficult customers, whether it's because I, I'm a bigger person or I have a voice or presence, I don't know. But um, so um, when I got to um, Goodfellow, this was um, September of 2005. And uh, approximately a month after that, um, Goodfellow um, had uh, one of their members um, killed in combat. Um, in fact, uh, the, the the folks that will be listening to this and even yourself, I'm sure you're aware of um, Elizabeth Jacobson, um, A1C Jacobson. Um, in fact, uh, Chief Master of the Air Force Bath the other day, she just went and posted a thing because Chief Bath, at one point, she was the command chief at the 17th training wing at Goodfellow Air Force Base. And um, so we had this death, you know, we had the death of one of our security forces members. And um, we did her will. We did her will in August, right before I got there. Um, her name was still in her because of everything that went on based upon what happened and all the memorial service we were doing. Um, we had our notary log where we notarized her will. We did all this stuff for her. Um, we helped put together the things. Uh, one of the gates right now, if I remember correctly, I think it's the south gate of uh, Goodfellow is the, uh, the Jacobson gate. Mm -hmm. And you go and you think about that in terms of, you know, working a PDF line. Um, I, I always liked working a PDF line, being on the other side of the deployment so much. But when it comes to things like that, to where it puts you in perspective, um, to be able to go and do something like that, where you're giving somebody who's certainly going out in harm's way a peace of mind and to make sure that what they want to happen, if 
God forbid the worst thing happens, will be taken care of. Um, that, that, that was kind of an eye opener for me of like, wow, you know, you, you just think about, oh, I'm just doing a paralegal, whatever. I mean, I, I think so many of us have done, you know, hundreds upon thousands of them without even thinking twice um, when it comes to the wills, because of course it was your will and it was also all the, the, the power of attorneys that accompanied it with it as well. And then you go and you look at it after the fact and you're like, wow, um, that, that we did something for, for that family now who was, you know, missing their loved one. We did something for them. And, um, th that, that's why I always liked about the, the customer service aspect of the, you know, of the, um, legal offices. You know, we, you know, even here at the law school, they talk about, you know, oh, JAG, court marshals, this and that. Um, there's a customer service side of it that we could, we really, really helped people mm -hmm. that when you go and you lift that burden off of them, that was always so awesome. I, I always, I always loved doing that. Even if, even if it was another agency that was giving them problems and it was a place where, you know, for instance, I knew the superintendent, hold on, give him a call real quick. Hey, what's going on? Hey, I got a person up here and they're saying this and this and this, can you help them out? Yeah, no problem. Um, people tend to forget that when they bring an issue in their, when somebody brings an issue into our office, um, it may be no big deal to us because we've seen it a hundred times. It's the biggest thing in the world to them. Mm -hmm. And to help them means everything. Mm -hmm. I get a little preachy sometimes. I apologize. No, that's good. That's, you know, definitely good to have that perspective, issue that perspective mm -hmm. um, in our world and how connected we truly are with with what's going on with the mission, with the fight, with the national defense strategy. Oh. Like we are, you know, we definitely have that. And, and one thing that I really appreciated mm -hmm. when I saw it, because when I left the career field in 2016 to be a PME instructor, we didn't have it. So when I went to paid, it was November this uh, 2019, I went to paid mm -hmm. and I saw it for the first time and it was the, uh, the flight plan. Right. That thing is amazing. I was like, I kept looking at it. I'm like, I need to save this. So I have it everywhere. I have a screenshot of it. And I look at it all the time because it tells, you know, it, it connects everything that we do, the Air Force priorities, the national defense strategy um, with, you know, what, what we're doing in, in, in the JAC Corps. Um, so I really, oh, I really like that. Absolutely. The work that, that's been done on that, uh, starting with uh, General Burney and, of course, continuing with General Rockwell. Um, General Rockwell and um, General Plummer being able to go and reduce it down to very much a very easy way to be able to go and put it together. Um, and, and even the organizations of how they're getting built to uh, um, mimic the flight plan, to be able to go and so you know exactly where you need to go and what you need to do. I mean, all of that is uh, uh, very purposeful. Um, and, and it's, it, I'm glad we're getting to the point where more people are starting to see where we fit into the bigger picture. Right. Right. Yeah. That was, that was definitely much needed because at times, again, me growing up as an airman and, and a young NCO coming up, sometimes we lost sight of that because, and not because we needed one document, but we definitely just all needed to be on the same page as far as this is how we contribute to the, you know, to the overall mission and maybe have a little bit more of an emphasis with that. And at times it starts, you know, with leadership in the office right. and then, you know, instilling that into the NCOICs who hopefully have some buy-in to continue to instill it um, to the airmen. Um, but oh, oh, Without a doubt, it, it starts at the leadership team of the, the individual wing leader off, uh, legal office in terms of, you know, how much involvement do you have with the outside agencies? How do you know the mission? Mm -hmm. And it's not just, you know, the senior folks that need to go and know it. it it's a little bit of everybody, um, you know, getting the tours of the, uh, the different facilities there to go and know the different missions. Um, we, we got involved at Goodfellow where um, this is back when they were doing the, uh, the GWAT training. And, uh, Believe it or not, the uh, the opposing forces for the GWAP uh, that we had at Goodfellow for the longest time, it wasn't the security forces, it was the legal office. We were the ones who were going out there as the opposing forces. Um, we had a Master Sergeant Chris Hernandez, um, now retired, who uh, was a former uh, security forces, and he had not only us paralegals, but the JAGs out there as well, 
And we were the one training the people going forward in terms of, you know, use of force, escalation of force, um, putting them in those odd situations where, you know, we're walking by with an, M, you know, an M16. Of course, we had to simulate um, AK-47. You know, what do you do? Well, I'm going to draw down on you. Um, everybody around there walks around with an AK-47. Are you going to draw down on everybody? Um, you know, get, getting that that piece on the outside to be able to put it together. Um, there was um, it was a it was quite a while back. Um, this was actually before I was ACC. Uh, one of the bases that I visited was um, Nellis. And um, I mean, granted, Nellis, extraordinarily busy base, a lot of stuff that goes on there. Um, and plus, it's in Las Vegas. Um, the numb nuts and the debauchery that goes on there is absolutely incredible. But um, they were so busy and insane that as I, um, I asked a few people, you know, have you ever um, been over to the Thunderbirds hangar? No. How long have you been here? Three years. You, you've been here three years and you've never been over to the Thunderbird hangar. You know, I'm sure you've taken, you've, you've heard them take off. You know, I know they do some things around here. Have you seen them fly at all? No. That, that, you know, th that's a sign that, you know, you, you need to get out. You need to see a little bit more. You need to go with, you know, know what's going on. And plus the Thunderbirds are pretty stinking cool. Mm -hmm. They've gotten better. Right. Yeah. Nice. No, just like the V2. So it's, it's, you know, amazing oh yeah when we took a we went from your guys's legal office um mm. over to uh because this is when uh chief green was the superintendent was the last time i was there and um her husband was the ammo chief over on the other side and so um one, we always talked to uh commanders and first sergeants and their chiefs and so we drove around over there and so we went past where they had some of the b2s out that is a trip to go and see those and um I, I never load them. I never wanted to load them, but <laughs> it, any aircraft that has a flat bed, flat bed that comes out to load and it, you have a load time of four hours, mm -hmm. I have, I wanted nothing to do with, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's amazing when you get a chance to see, you know, th the hardware that we have as an air force out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's even more trippy when you see what it, it did or what it can do, which, mm -hmm. you know, from my time in Afghanistan or when I, when I was a bomb loader when I was in Afghanistan, um, you know, I, I've loaded bombs that uh, dropped on actual Taliban mm -hmm. targets and it is a humbling experience when that plane comes back and it's empty and you go, mm -hmm. what did I just do? <laughs> That's somewhere. Yeah. Um, well, chief, um, I really, you know, again, want to thank you for taking the time, uh, to talk to us and to, to share your perspective. This has been, you know, very, a lot of fun for me and very insightful as well as we, you know, definitely continue to make sure that we're, you know, going in the right direction and uh, with, the par with the paralegal career field as a whole and with the Jack Court as a whole. So um, again, thanks. And I'm, I'm not sure if you'd like to, you know, share some closing, uh, a closing <laughs> message or remarks for, um, for everyone watching. Um, I, I think the one thing I, I would share with everybody is just a huge, um, thank you. Um, it's a, a thank you to everybody that, uh, before I left, I did get a chance to thank, um, b because the air force for my family, for me has given me so much, um, that I can never go and thank them enough, um, for the opportunities that I have, the things that I got to see, the things that I got to do, um, the fact that, uh, you know, the, the education that uh, I was able to get from it has led me to, you know, where I am now. Um, always remember, you know, where you come from. Always remember that uh, you need to treat people nice because you want people to treat you nice as well. Um, no matter how much rank you get, um, remember it can go away. Um, we're not our ranks, we're people. Um, there, there's so many lessons and different things that I learned in the air force that, uh, will probably carry me forward for the rest of my life. And I, I just ask that everybody, you know, give everything they have, give it with all their heart, um, trust in your leaders. I, uh, there's decisions that get made that you're not going to understand. I promise you that they're deliberate. They're made for a reason. Um, 
know that your best interests are always in in heart. And uh, the last thing I'll say of all that is I miss everybody. I really do. <laughs> um, I, I'm thankful for Facebook to be able to go, but uh, I've been very, very purposeful of not getting out as much. Um, I know Chief Conger's in ACC right now. I know he's doing incredible things. Um, of course, you know, all, all the NAF PMs, um, you know, in ACC, I still know them. I'm Facebook friends, I think, with almost everybody. But uh, they've been absolutely incredible, this kind of doing their own thing. Um, but when you have amazing people, um, quite frankly, um, if you're in a leadership position and you have amazing people around you, it makes your job easy because you just sit back and you watch these people shine. And I know for a fact, that's what they're doing. That's what all y'all are going to be doing. Um, and Al, I'm proud of you. You're, you've been doing great. <laughs> Definitely looking forward to seeing, to seeing you uh, continue along. And certainly with this podcast, this is an incredible idea. Um, taking the message out to the people so they, they hear it and they know what's going on. Um, yeah, it sucks. I'm going to get emotional if I keep on talking. <laughs> I really do miss you all. That's right. Well, I, I know that we're going to continue to, you know, to see you and to, and to hear from you, um, you know, as we move forward. Because I had a lot of fun and, and you had so much insight to provide. So I know that I, I don't think this is going to be the last time that we're going to have you um, here on the podcast either. So Everybody reach out to him then. And if you want me to come back and talk about something, by all means, just let him know. I already jokingly once told Chief Green that if she wants me to come to the schoolhouse one of these summers, I have to be in between. I have to be in between semesters because right now I'm working a lot. Right. But I'll be more than happy to talk to anybody because uh, if you have a dream, you can do it. Absolutely. Well, Chief, thank you so much. I know I took um, took a lot of your time over here. It's like almost two I, hours. I apologize. I took a whole bunch of your time. <laughs> no it's all good it was it was fun it was uh it was a pr uh, pleasure talking to you for sure no it's it's great definitely catching up because well like, like we said it's been almost a decade since we've seen yeah. each other that's still, just crazy to me i know i still can't believe that now i saw you because we're facebook friends right and i see you know when when you when you said when you were jai and you were traveling and um when you were you know transitioning from one position mm -hmm. to another i, I kept I feel like, which is why it makes it so weird to, to think that we never saw each other again since Cass is because I feel like I've known mm -hmm. your path and what you've been doing since then. So, Yeah, uh, Zach Bolda hit me up once and he was like, oh, do you realize that there's a lot of people that just kind of watch where you check in just to see where in the world you are? <laughs> Make sure you're not coming to inspect us. Yeah. I'm like, Damn, Zach, you know, I'll give you a heads, I'll give you a heads up if I'm coming to see you. That's right. Yeah. Head it over here. Uh oh. Are we getting are we getting hit? Yeah. Now, now I think about it. I saw Zach uh, when I did that Korea trip. Zach went over there with us on behalf of PACAF, so I got a chance to hang out with him. I don't know have, he was at Kadena too, yes. Yeah, so Yeah, I met him. Yeah, I talked okay. to him. I was doing my a little bit of my reintegr reintegration with him at the Kadena legal office. So gotcha. yeah, he was gotcha. there with uh, senior Martin, who's amazing. I know mm -hmm. she was recently retired, but she was I mean, and again, me uh being a PME and, mm -hmm. and uh, it, her being the loss of the base legal office, she I mean, she stayed in touch or kept in touch and, and keeping me in the loop of everything that was going on in the paralegal world. She came to my little promotion ceremony when I made master, like that's just the kind of person that I just got have to right. give her a shout out. That's just the kind of person that she is. The, the level of talent in the air force, let alone even, you know, certainly the Jack Corps, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and traveling around, whether it be JI or ACC, that was, the thing that made my chest swell every single time. I know uh, when I traveled with uh, now retired General um, Schaefer when she was ACC and uh, Colonel um, Ecton, um, when, when we did our trips and we saw the amazing things that people were doing, um, it was just, it filled us with pride to see how hard everybody was working, how incredible they were. And I mean, they're so much smarter than us. 
the, the mm-hmm. things that, you know, they figured out was just, it was insane. And, you know, and that was, you know, what it came down to part of our job of, you know, they had these great ideas, but it was something, you know, structurally that was getting in the way for them to be able to go and do it. And that's when it came, I think the more fun for me, because like, you know what, I can be a bull in a china shop now because my job is to break down this barrier so they can go and do this. Mm-hmm. So there was times I would go to bases and um, they would say, well, the reason why we can't do this is because NPF is saying this. Cool. So I've been a meeting with the NPF uh, superintendent with, for me. Right. I'll say it. I don't care. Yeah. What are they do? Demote me? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That was the fun part to be able to go and, and I hated using the stripe, but if I could ever use it to make the life of the people around easier mm-hmm. in a heartbeat. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned the people um, and being amazed because now, so with this podcast, I've been looking at, you know, ONS and whenever they mm-hmm. publish the award winners or they publish probably of the month. So I reach out to these individuals to do the podcast, right? And, we, and I talk to them before we do the podcast and then do the podcast, but I am so amazed at their level of commitment of pursuit of excellence, uh, the ideas that they have and just the willingness to want to, to, to contribute is I've been, I've been blown away uh, mm-hmm. just doing that, right. Um, reaching out to those individuals who are doing great things. There was uh, another staff sergeant that I did. Um, I did a podcast with for the AIB uh, and he was all about the AIB and he, I mean, we spent like over an hour just talking about his role and he was like so energized. About that, that was Sergeant Haley, if I remember Sergeant right. Sergeant Haley, that's yep. right. Yeah, he, I mean, it was such a great conversation to have with him. Uh, so that just goes to show the, the caliber of, of our people at, our, at all levels, uh, doing all kinds of things. Um, and, and I reached out to, right. So Sergeant Olaya Gonzalez, who's at in Honduras, mm-hmm. and also like, he's just so excited about doing what he was doing about the mission and mm-hmm. wow, <laughs> this is really cool. I, I am so thankful. And I think a, a lot of us chiefs have always say this every single year of like the promotions of when you see the people who are getting promoted and you see the caliber of the people we would always say, you know, I'm glad I'm not competing against them. <laughs> um, so, so glad because, you know, it's not like they're, they're, these people are going out of their way for anything. They're just, they're killing it. Right. They're doing phenomenal. Right. And, um, you know, grading um, the, the TJAG award packages, every, you know, every time we go and see those, sitting there and trying to like pick a number one or two or three or being able to say, okay, I, I have like the top, five right here and now i'm gonna have to split hairs to figure out where these people fall in because you have there's no bad stuff on it of what they do right. um they're, they're taking care of the mission they're doing things they're getting outside um their offices and they're they're getting involved in the communities um they're getting their education which me personally um that was something that you know we all kind of had our little biases my bias was people getting their education um because my opinion was always you know you can get court martial tomorrow um last i checked they can't take away your bachelor's degree they they, they might try to recoup the tuition assistance that they went and they paid you but last i checked a you will lose your bachelor's degree is not a uh, an authorized punishment um it's um yeah it's it's incredible and i know over the years going forward um it, it, there, people are going to get smarter and smarter. It's going to involve more and more. Um, the, you guys is a DCMS. I, I saw a thing that the, the case management system. Right. <sighs> I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> it, if it's anything, what has been briefed over the last few years that I've seen, if it's anything that has any of the components, um, I, I got the opportunity to play around with a initial working group on that. This was back in 2014 though. Um, unfortunately that version of it didn't go forward because uh, the contract fell out if I, if I was told correctly. But if it does what um, it's gonna do, um, I think the biggest problem that we're gonna have is the system's gonna be so smart 
that we're going to have to train people why the system is doing what it's doing which that's a blessing and that's a curse you know yeah. well okay why is it going and pushing this particular document out because if you look at rcm blah 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 mm. or you know right if you look at article <laughs> this and that it's the reason why it's doing this is because of this um that that almost might be the danger right. of it um i'm you know so. i'm jealous I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of that as a mil as an old military justice dude but uh but at the same time, it's okay because at some point, if I get my law degree, you know, who knows? Maybe I might venture out into the uh, big uh, defense world, and uh, mm -hmm. may maybe some folks might see me in a different capacity in a Air Force courtroom again. Huh. That'll be that would be interesting, and I would definitely look forward to that. <laughs> I think some people would probably want to punch me in the face if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Chief. Well, again, thank you so much. I hope you have a, you know, you have a good night. And uh... you, you too, brother. And if you ever need anything from me, you always know how to find me. Yes, sir. We'll do. Well. All right. You, you all take, right, care. take care. Good night.